We have a great pleasure in organizing a special guest lecture today by an eminent speaker. Uh, we request our director, Vice Chancellor, Madam, to come out to the dais. Then uh, we also request our speaker of the day, Dr. C. Sham, to come out to the dais. We request uh, Professor uh, BCM Prasad, former dean and the professor of neurosurgery to come out to the dais. So it is a great occasion for us to have with us Dr. Sham Chiravuri. He is an alumni from the Andhra Medical College, Shakapatnam. He did his MBBS from there. And thereafter, he had a single-minded pursuit, that is, to do internal medicine in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences at New Delhi. Then there was only one All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Come many opportunities, come many specialties, come many institutes, including the PGI. They were all only testers. He had eventually secured the branch of his choice at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, that is internal medicine. After doing his uh, MD in internal medicine, Dr. Sham had uh, worked in very eminent hospitals in New Delhi, including the RML Hospital. And thereafter, he had moved out to the United States of America. He, while in internal medicine, he also had a great interest in uh, nephrology, biostatistics, epidemiology, and research methodology. With this background, he migrated to the United States. And presently, he is a leading public health expert in the UNT in the United States. There is another dimension to him. He's a very well-known literary figure. He's a very well-known story writer in Telugu. He has a style of writing in Mani Prabhadam. You need to know three languages at least to follow the flow with a unique signature style of writing. Even if his name is not there, you can identify that it is his story. If you have heard the names Yandamuri, Virendranath, Maladi, Venkata, Krishnamurti, etc. The present generation may be familiar. He is at or above that group. So a man with multiple dimensions this is the semi-formal introduction I have given, but I would request uh, Professor B.C.M. Prasad to give the um, informal or differently formal introduction about Dr. Shah. Dr. Prasad. Thank you very much. Dr. Shyam, na chinna pate mitru. I am going to matlaad mante. Na ko chadan ga okelaga opportunity an pinchindi, matlaad mohni sa opportunity an pinchindi. विजयनगर अनकपल दशाखंड विजयनगर अंप विजयन अच्छी चुनाव कल नाग क्लास ऐद क्लास अच्छी 
ఈ అరే నుంచి అతను నుంచి ఆయన ఇలా రూపాంతరాలని చెంది ఇప్పుడు ప్రస్తుతం యునైటెడ్ స్టేట్స్ లో సెటిల్ అయి ఉన్నాడు ప్రస్తుతానికి చిన్నప్పటి నుంచి కూడా అతను ఎక్కువగా చదువులోనే గడిపేవాడు ఎక్కువగా మాతో తిరిగేవాడు మా నాలుగు రోజులు ఫ్రెండ్స్ ఉండేవాళ్ళని ఎక్కువ చదువులో గడిపేవాడు ఏ పుస్తకం ఆ పుస్తకం లేదు పాఠ్య పుస్తకాలు ఇంట్లో ఎలాగో చదివేశాడు వెంటనే ఎంగి చదివే ఆయన యాక్షన్ తగ్రహి ఇది కాకుండా అప్పట్లో మా ఇళ్లలో అందరిలో కూడా పత్రికలు మాత పత్రికలు నవలలు డిటెక్టర్లు ఇవన్నీ బ్యాండ్ ఇవన్నీ ఇళ్లలో చదవనిచ్చేవారు కాదు పాడైపోతావని కానీ వాళ్ళ ఇంట్లో వాళ్ళ నాన్నగారిని ఎక్కువ పరిచయం లేదు నాకు వాళ్ళ అమ్మగారితో బాగా పరిచయం ఎంత ఫ్రీ హ్యాండ్ ఇచ్చేవారు అంటే వాళ్ళ ఇంట్లో అన్ని చదవరని ఆయన ఏమి పర్వాలేదు మనిషి పాడవడం చెడిపోవడం అన్నది వాడిలో ఉంటుంది అన్నది వాడికి నాలుగో క్లాస్ ఐదో క్లాస్ నుంచే వాళ్ళ ఇంట్లో వాడు అంత ఫ్రీ హ్యాండ్ ఇచ్చాడు సో క్లాస్ పుస్తకాలు అవన్నీ ఎప్పుడు చదువుకునేవాడు కానీ వాళ్ళు వింత ఏంటంటే మాకందరికీ అణువు పరమాణువు అంటే ఏమిటో తెలియని టైంలోనే అప్పుడు అణువు అని పరమాణు అని ఆకాశంలో అద్భుతాలు ఇలాంటి వ్యాసాలు పుస్తకాలు ఇలాంటివన్నీ చదువుతూ ఉండేవాడు సరే చదువుకుంటున్నాళ్ళే మనకి అనుకునేవాడు రిపబ్లిక్ డే నాడు ఆగస్ట్ పదిహేను నాడు పెద్ద కాంపిటేటివ్ స్పిరిట్ ఉండేది కాదు వీడిని చూసి బలవంతంగా తెచ్చుకోవాల్సి వచ్చేది వచ్చి అప్పట్లో చాలా మందుకు ఈయన ప్రైజులు అవి కొట్టేవాడు ఆటలు పాటలు మేము అంతసేపు ఈ జోరబాలు ఆడుకోవడం ఏడు పెంకులాట అల్లికాయలు క్రికెట్ ఇవన్నిటిలో గంట టైం స్పెండ్ చేసేవాడు ఈయన మాతో ఉండేవాడు కానీ అరగంట గంట ఉండేవాడు తర్వాత గ్రంథాలయానికి వెళ్ళటము ఈవినింగ్ గ్రంథాలయం ఉంటుందని చాలా రోజులు నాకు తెలియదు వీటికి వెళ్ళి అక్కడ చదువుకోవటము ఏ పుస్తకం ఈ పుస్తకం అని కాదు ఆ పుస్తకం అని కాదు అంతటిలో అప్పట్లోనే ఈయన ఏదో క్లియోపాత్ర నువ్వులు కోటలనే పెళ్ళగించా ఇలాంటివన్నీ చెప్తుండేవాడు ఏంటో చెప్తున్నట్లు అయినా అనుకునేవాడు అప్పట్లోనే రెండు మూడు సార్లు మాకు సిక్స్ సెవెంత్ ఎయిత్ ఆ టైంకే ఈయన కవితలు కొన్ని అచ్చు పడ్డాయి అప్పుడు అనిపించా వీడేదో చేస్తున్నాడు అచ్చు పడ్డాయి వీడికి వెంకటేశ్వర వస్తున్నాడు అప్పటికీ ఇంకా మాకు మాకు పరిపక్వత లేదు వాడికి ఉంది కానీ వాటితో తెలియదు ఏదో గన్నం చెట్టు మీద పెట్టినంత మాత్రంలో దాని వాసన కాగితం పూలకి అబ్బదు అలాగే వాటి తిరుగుతున్నాయి కానీ మాకేమి అబ్బలేదు సరే వదిలేసాం మాకంటే నాలాంటి వాళ్ళు ఇద్దరు ముగ్గురు ఫ్రెండ్స్ ఉన్నారు ఒకటి ఇయర్స్ లోని ఒకటి ఇట్లా ఏమిటండి అక్కడ ఇక్కడ సైంటిస్ట్ అది కానీ ఈయన వైఖరి వేరు ఈయన డాక్టరు మాకన్నా నాకన్నా ముందే సెలెక్ట్ అయ్యి అందుకేసి ముందుకు వెళ్ళిపోయాడు అన్నీ ఉన్నాయి ఉంటూనే మా ఇద్దరం టచ్ లో ఉన్న వాళ్ళ లేవన్నది మా ఇద్దరికి తెలియదు తావు రకం నీటి పొట్టు వ్యవహారంలో ఉండేది ఆయన ఏం చేస్తున్నాడు అన్న దాని మీద పెద్దగా కాన్సన్ట్రేట్ చేసేవాళ్ళం కానీ మెల్లమెల్లగా ఆయన చాలా ఎత్తుకి ఎదిగిపోయాడు అన్న విషయం మాత్రం మాకు అర్థమైంది ఫిజియాలజీ అంటే చిన్నప్పటి నుంచి చాలా ఇంట్రెస్ట్ ఉన్నారు విపరీతంగా మేము వీఆర్ రీడింగ్ బట్ హీ వర్ స్టడీయింగ్ రెండింటికి చాలా తేడా అతను ఫిజియాలజీలోనే తలమూలకులుగా ఉండేవాడు అలా అని మిగతా సబ్జెక్ట్ వదిలేసాడని కాదు కానీ ఫిజియాలజీ అంటే నాకు మిగిర అని చెప్తూ ఉండేవాడు అప్పటి నుంచి కూడా నాకు ఒకటే జయం ఆల్ ఇండియా ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ నేను ఆల్రెడీ అలాడ్ మోహన్ చెప్పాడు ఆల్ ఇండియా ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ మెడికల్ సైన్సెస్లో నేను ఎండి జనరల్ మెడిసిన్ చేయాలి అప్పట్లో పీజీఐ చండీగఢ్లో జనరల్ మెడిసిన్ అన్నా కూడా చాలా మంచి పేరు ప్రఖ్యాతి ఉన్నాయి అందులో వచ్చినా కూడా వదిలేసాడు అదేంటో అలా వదిలేస్తామంటే నాకు ఇక్కడే చేయాలి ఇలాగే చేయాలి సరే వీటి గురించి మాకు ముందు నుంచి తెలుసు కాబట్టి వాడిని పెద్దగా పట్టించుకోలేదు సరే వాడు ఎలాగో అలాగే అప్పుడప్పుడు సాధిస్తాడు డెఫినెట్ గా వాడు ఒక గొప్పడు అవుతాడు అనే ఒక ఉద్దేశం ఉండేది మాకు అది కాలం ట్రై చేస్తుంది ఒకసారి అన్ని కాలంలో అందరూ కాదు కదా అది సో ఈ ఆల్ ఇండియా ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ ఆఫ్ మెడికల్ సైన్సెస్ లోని ఎండి జనరల్ మెడిసిన్ చేసేటప్పుడు ఈ అల్లాడి మోహన్ అనేటటువంటి బ్రిడ్జ్ నాకు వాడికి మధ్యలో మళ్ళీ పని లేకపోతే అలా దూరతో అయిపోతున్నాడు అవుట్ ఆఫ్ సైట్ అయిపోతున్న టైంలో ఈ అల్లాడి మోహన్ అనేటటువంటి పటిష్టమైనటువంటి బ్రిడ్జ్ మమ్మల్ని ఇద్దరిని బాగా కలిపి నన్ను పరిచయం చేయమని ఆయన చెప్పినప్పుడు ఒక విధంగా సంతోషం వేసింది ఒక విధంగా నాకు ఏం చెప్తాం వాడి గురించి రోజు కలిసి తిరిగే వాళ్ళని చెప్పమంటారా రోజు వాడు రోజు రోజుకి వాడు ఎక్కొక్క మెట్టు ఎక్కుతున్నాడు మేము ఆయాస పడుతూ వెళ్ళకలేకపోతున్నాం అని చెప్పాలా అసలు ఏం చెప్పాలా అని అనుకున్నాను కానీ మళ్ళీ జన్మలో ఇలాంటి అదృష్టం నాకు దొరుకుతుందో లేదు అందుకని 
తప్పకుండా అయ్యా నేను చెప్తాను నేను ఏం పరిచయం చేస్తాను ఈయన చిన్నప్పుడు ఒక బుక్ చూశాను సిబిల్ అని ఒక అమ్మాయి పుస్తకం బొమ్మ ఉంటుంది దాని మీద గళ్ళు గీస్తుంటాయి పదహారు మొకాలుగా చూ ఉంటుంది అనమాట అది ఒకే మనిషి అలాగ బహుముఖ ప్రజ్ఞాశాలి అయినటువంటి ఈయన ఏకసంత గ్రాహి నిగర్వి నిగర్వి అన్నది ఇప్పుడు వాడిని చూసి తెలుస్తూనే ఉంటుంది మీకు దండలు దండాలు బొకేలు ఫోటోలు షాలువులు వీటన్నిటికీ దూరంగా ఉంటాడు మనిషి ఒక డాక్టర్గా ఒక కథకుడుగా రచయితగా అందరికీ చాలా దగ్గరగా ఉంటాడు మంచి జ్ఞాపక శక్తి చిన్నప్పుడే చెప్పేవాడు ఒరే కుమ్మూరు వేణుగోపాలరావు అనేవాడు ఒక హౌస్ సర్జన్ నావల్ రాసాడు అది చదువు చదివితే ఇన్స్పిరేషన్ ఫర్ డాక్టర్స్ అని చెప్పేవాడు అప్పుడు నాకు హౌస్ సర్జన్ అంటే తెలియదు నావల్ ఇంట్లో చదవని ఎవరు సరే లేరు ఎప్పుడు చదువుతానులే అని ఈ మధ్య చదివాను ఆల్రెడీ ఒక వన్ ఇయర్ బ్యాక్ చదువు ఉంటాను కుమ్మూరు వేణుగోపాల రావు సజ్జన్ అనేటటువంటి నవల్ అది ఇది మేము గడిపినటువంటి జీవితం ఎక్కువ టైం నేను తీసుకుంటే వాటి నుంచి వచ్చేటటువంటి మోర్ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ అబౌట్ ది ప్రజెంట్ డే ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ గ్లోబల్ హెల్త్ వాటి గురించి మిస్ అయిపోతుంది ఇది ఎందుకంటే జస్ట్ ఒక అవుదర్ సైడ్ ఆఫ్ ఎ పర్సన్ తెలియాలి మీకు అందుకని చెప్పాను చిట్ చివరిగా ఒక చిన్న జ్ఞాపకం ఏంటంటే నేను ఒక పౌర్ణమి నాడు హరిద్వార్లో గంగా స్నానం చేసి గట్లో ఇది పెట్టి సెల్ ఫోన్ పెట్టి పూర్తిగా మొలిగి బయటికి వచ్చా వచ్చే టైంకి ఫోన్ మోగుతుంది ఫోన్ మోగుతుంటే అంత తడిలోని ఎవడో వీడి ఎందుకు చేశాడు ఈ టైంలోని అని ఫోన్ తీసాను తీస్తే వాడు ఒరే నువ్వు నీకు మా అమ్మ అంటే చాలా ఇష్టం కదా మా అమ్మకి ఎన్ను అంటే చాలా ఇష్టం కదా అట్లా వాడు బాగా చూసుకునేవాడు వాడితో ఈక్వల్గా ఆమె చనిపోయింది అన్నాడు నేనే మాట్లాడలేకపోయాను అలా ఉండిపోయాను మౌనంగా మళ్ళా రెండు నిమిషాలు రెండు సెకండ్లు పోయిన తర్వాత ఆయన అన్నాడు అంత ఇష్టం కాబట్టి కాబోలు ఈ సమయంలో నువ్వు గంగా స్నానం చేస్తున్నావు అన్నాడు అయితే ఆ మాట యూజువల్ గా మాకేమి రియాక్షన్స్ రిఫ్లెక్షన్స్ ఉండవు కానీ అంత తడి మొత్తం తడిసిపోయాను మనిషిని నాకు కూడా కొంచెం కళ్ళు చిమర్చాయి ఆ టైంలో అది ఎవరో చెప్పినట్టు ఆ తల్లి తండ్రి మన చాయిస్ కాదు కానీ మంచి స్నేహితుడు మాత్రం మన చాయిస్ మనం పోగొట్టుకున్నవాడు దురదృష్టవంతుడు ఉంచుకున్నవాడు అదృష్టవంతుడు భూమిలో ఇంతటితోటి ఆయన్ని మిగతా కార్యక్రమంలోకి వెళ్ళమని అల్లాడి మోహన్ గారిని రిక్వెస్ట్ చేస్తూ నాకు ఇటువంటి అవకాశం ఐ థింక్ వన్స్ ఇన్ ఎ బ్లూ మోన్ ఎవరికి కూడా రాదు అంత చిన్నప్పటి నుంచి వచ్చిన ఫ్రెండ్ ని అంత ఎత్తుకు ఎదిగిన వాడిని ఇంత కింద ఉన్న వాడిని నేను కూడా రాయస్ కింద కాదు మామూలుగా కూడా కింద ఉన్న వాడిని నాకు వాడిని పొగడడం అంటే నాకు ఇష్టం ఉండదు వాడికి ఎలాగో ఇష్టం ఉండదు వాడి గురించి చెప్పే అవకాశం నాకు దొరికినందుకు చాలా థ్యాంక్ యూ థ్యాంక్ యూ we now request uh, dr sham to deliver his guest lecture over to dr sham project sir tara dimpal 
Good afternoon, everybody. At the outside, I would like to thank Director Madam and Dean and uh, former Dean Dr. Prasad and, and, and dear friends. I'm very happy to be here. And I feel this is a rare honor and opportunity for me to express myself. Today, I will give a, 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 some thoughts of mine on clinical medical at public health at global public health education. Some of my thoughts I would tell. Uh, all of the thoughts may not be liked by all of you, but just I wanted to share my thoughts and express my views on these aspects. At the beginning of my talk, I would like to quote Rudyard Kipling. I keep six honest stabbing men. They taught me all I knew. The names are what and where and when and how and why and who. Kipling says that he just got the six honest serving men. They taught him everything. I think in clinical medicine or public health, if every one of us know how to ask questions, these questions, these six questions of English language and try to answer them in an effective way, we would be able to learn everything. That's what I think. I just wanted to say something about my teaching philosophy. Because today I have seen here about the efforts being made on medical education and curriculum development and training for medical teachers. So I just like to talk about my teaching philosophy. That is simply to create a sense in the student's mind about the objectives of learning. Once the objectives of learning are clear in the mind of the student, he would be able to learn himself and move forward. As I said earlier, any subject, especially clinical medicine or public health, the, the six questions, if the person knows how to ask them and how to answer them, he would be able to understand everything. Uh, any subject I mean, even in business management groups also, people will say that five W's and one H, they call it. Whatever we said, the six questions of English language, the business management people say, five W's and one H. That's why I said any subject, but it's more relevant to clinical medicine and public health. It's not just getting a passing grade or a better grade. It should be the aim of any student or should be the aim of any teacher. The proper way of to understand things is, is to understand what is it? It is the ability to ask the right and relevant questions. And it is the ability to understand what is right and what is wrong? It is the ability to try to answer the questions raised and it is the ability to admit one's inability to answer the questions if one cannot answer the questions. When we do not know something, it is best to accept and say, I do not know, rather than pushing it to under the carpet. Here I wanted to say some of my beliefs. I believe the best student does not require any teaching except for an occasional advice or some guidance. But he or she should be allowed to think, speak, or experiment. We used to have a faculty at All India Institute of Medical Science. He used to say that this is the greatest opportunity to uh, experiment. You are given patients, uh, try to treat them your own way, try to come to the right conclusions. If you are unable to do anything properly, please come back to us, we will guide you but try to experiment yourself. This is the greatest opportunity you get when you are a student, but once you become a professional, 
you will not have this opportunity, he used to say. And I totally believe that a, a student should be allowed to think, speak, or experiment. Of course, under supervision. The average to average students, they do need teaching. And these are the students who are the challenges of the teachers. I believe this category of students, if trained properly, could contribute much to the health of any society and should be the target of all of the teachers. I believe evaluation of learning is very important, but punishing for mistakes does not serve any purpose. If you fail somebody first time, probably he would do better. You fail him twice, his performance will go down. Ultimately, you have to pass him somehow. You have to pull him up. So I do not believe in punishing students. Evaluation is important whether the person learned it or not, but just punishing for mistakes is not the way I believe. Students should understand why he should learn and how one should correct oneself when one goes wrong. If he understands that, he'll find a way to come back to the right track. A consultant is a person, it's not that a consultant doesn't make mistakes. Consultant is a person who comes back to the right track and correct himself in the proper way after committing a mistake. So we should make consultants out of our students. We should tell them that, don't worry, don't feel bad, don't feel shy if you go wrong, but find a way how to come back to the right track and correct yourself. If objectives of learning are clear and attitude is the right, self-evaluation, auto-correction are possible, I believe. I would like to make some elaboration of clinical medicine, medical education with a small note on public health and global public health. There is a, always a problem between clinicians and public health personnel. Clinical medicine versus public health. Even though for both of these clinical medicine as well as public health, Hippocrates is the father, we still continue to have problems. Clinical physicians will have problems with public health personnel. Public health personnel will think that they are better than clinicians. I think they should, there is a need to bridge the gap between them and we should make them go or move on the same way towards the same goal. Public health, some time ago, public health is the health aspects of the one country is known as public health. They, some time ago, they used to use the word international health or IH or international cooperation or IC. That actually means the public health of dealing with more, with more than one country, about two countries is known as international health. But after AIDS has been came to the picture, what happened is it, it was felt that international health and international cooperation is no more sufficient. We need to have a global perspective, global public health. After 90s, middle 90s, slowly people developed the idea of global public health. Now, regarding the medical education, I would like to talk in terms of entry or preparation or before med school or medical education while in med school and after, after that. I would like to talk on these lines. The very idea of pre-medical school or med school education is to have a very effective post-medical school professional performance, day-to-day -day performance. What I wanted to say is that whatever you learn in the medical school, you might learn so many things. But ultimately, what is the most important thing is that your day-to-day -day ability to perform well, your day-to-day -day work should be very good. Not that in examinations you will do well or in presentations you will do very well and in, in conferences and lectures you talk beautifully. That's not the aim of uh, all the, the very idea of pre-medical or medical school education. The very idea is to improve the performance of day-to-day -day performance. Because ultimately your day-to-day -day work is going to be useful to the patient, individual patient and to the community. So the very idea should be to prepare a person to be the, one of the best doctors in that area. Now I'd like to say a couple of things about entry level or preparation level or before med school level of education. In our country, I when I joined into a medical school, I was about 17 years and most of us joined medical school at the uh, age of 17. Now in Western countries, in many places, 21 years or later, people would 
get into med schools. We used to have a rule that one cannot join medical school after 21 or 22. I think recently it has been revised and people can join at 22 also. I personally believe joining late is important because at 17, one just does not know what he wants to be. Just because peers or colleagues or uh, society or pressures of the parents or colleagues pushes them so they would like to get into a, a subject like medicine, but they actually do not know whether they wanted to actually become doctors and lead their life as doctors till the end. Probably 21 years would be better. And maybe after a, after a four year degree course, it will be better to do medical course. People say that by 21, one will be very old and then you do medicine, then post graduation, then fellowship. Half of the life will be spent on uh, medical education. But why I'm saying 21, because a person should know it's a lifelong, learning necessity is there in this field. One cannot just read something and finish, pass the examination and forget about it. He needs to know that he or she needs to know that he should continue throughout his or her life to learn. Because change is the only constant in health, health uh, field. That's one thing I wanted to tell. Educational background is important because by educational background means we think that somebody is having a biological science or a science background, that's the general aid idea. But my idea of educational background means the general global growth of the individual is important. Or a period of time, we lose interest in reading books. My friend talked about my reading interests at a very long, lengthy fashion. But today it is not possible to do like that. At our time, we did not have so many digressions, maybe a radio or maybe some books. That is the only digression from day-to-day -day academic work and other works. But now every student has got a smartphone, social media accounts. Every second somebody wants or not, one will get a social media message or something like that. It's just not possible to sit half an hour and read anything, leave alone textbooks or general books. But that is what is crippling our students and their global growth as an individual is hampered. I personally feel that educational background means apart from science, social sciences also to be introduced. At some level, this person should have cultural competence. At some level, this person should have empathy, who is going to become a doctor. At some level, he needs to understand the pain and suffering of the people. At some time, he needs to understand human psychology and human brain to help them. So that way, a sort of global general growth of the individual is important, not just reading textbooks. So we should find as educators a way to improve the global development of the individual who is going to become a medical doctor. This medical doctor is going to become a medical doctor. is supposed to have certain attributes or qualities as a person who intends to become a medical doctor. Whether this particular person is fit to be a medical doctor or not is to be decided. Unfortunately, in our scheme of things, in our education system, there is no way. We just have all focus on factual knowledge. We just give a few set of multiple choice questions. A person who is capable of getting a couple of training courses or coaching centers will mug up and try to answer more questions and is likely to become a doctor who might not be having the basic attributes or qualities of a doctor. In our system, that is not there. There is no consideration for the person's personality is not there. I believe that as, as an educational background and there is a part of general global growth of the individual, this aspect is to be given importance. Recently, I hear about something about physician's pledge. Lot of discussion on Hippocratic oath versus Charak Sapath in medical colleges has taken place. I just thought a person can do, do both pledges or even more pledges, but more than the pledges, what is important is that should be able to do whatever he's pledging, should be able to willing to do whatever he is, has got in his pledge, whether he takes Hippocratic oath or Charak Sapath or something else, that's not important. A person should be willing to know that and be prepared to practice that throughout his professional life. When we are talking so much of, about Sharka Shabbat, we are just ignoring 
the first volume of charak samhita which describes the characteristics traits of a person who should be a physician but in our scheme of things there is no place for such things so i emphasize on on the, all these medical teachers future medical teachers should keep in their minds that this is important and they should impress upon their students this important aspect at every possible occasion now there is another discussion is going on in the country should we teach them in their mother tongue mother tongue based instruction what are the advantages or their advantages what are the implications uh there are many people or some of the medical associations are also upset that there are practices to teach medicine in their native languages maybe hindi tamil or whatever it is so far telugu people have not come forward to say that they are going to teach in telugu i do not have any objection and i personally feel that enough evidence if science is taught in the mother tongue the person would learn in a better way so they understand the medical science at it at the tender age be 21 or 17 even now it is 17 not yet 21 but at the tender age probably they are well versed with their mother tongues we assume i am not sure about that about especially about telugu people how good they are in their own mother tongue i am not sure about it but anyway it is very good idea to teach in the native language but there should not be attempt of sanskritized or very tough languages words medical terminology technical terminology should not be translated into the regional languages under the garb of mother tongue the idea is to use the verbs tense that could be in the mother tongue the total sentence could be in the mother tongue or the regional language but the technical te terminology should be retained so that at a later time the person can transition to in english or the international language is possible is there a necessity for transition yes there is a necessity for transition you may be able to develop textbooks in the regional languages in the telugu or tamil or whatever it is you may even develop textbooks uh, in regional language because i, I have been to iran some time ago some time long ago there i have seen harrison is a completely translated into farsi in germany in france french country paris they they talk only in their language in china many people mention that they teach in their own language japan also it is a practice but the idea is that you cannot translate the journals at a such a rapid fashion if you try to emphasize on the local language probably there would be a time when there would not be a person who will be able to translate from the international language to local language so to start with we can teach in the mother tongue and slowly we should make some transition to the international clearly required language that's what i personally feel the, the time has come for the, for all of us to think about the preparedness for entry into medical school what is the preparedness for entry into medical school when we were students when we were before joining medical schools after 10th standard we just we were divided into biological sciences and physical sciences and chemistry as one group mathematics physics chemistry and other group so the biological student is totally deprived of mathematical background so at a later date when he completes med school he is afraid of mathematics he does not know mathematics advanced uh, mathematical knowledge basis he does not have he is afraid of statistics he is afraid of using a statistical package and in those days people are not computer savvy so they were not able to usage any package also easily so to to strengthen this to remove this difficulty i personally feel that mathematical base should be strengthened for the medical students maybe after they enter medical school it is not again possible to make them sit down and learn mathematics so i think in the intermediate period either 12th standard level or in the four year preparatory period before med school their mathematical base should be strengthened their knowledge of statistics should be enhanced introduction of research methodology should be introduced for understanding research methodology one need not know medical or general medical or biological knowledge because this research methodology is there in all areas 
if you even simply watch certain good channels they are also doing certain such research methods they are applying so this understanding of research methodology should be started at a early age even probably even before if one enters the medical school i think but later during the medical school and subsequently it should be reinforced strengthened and repeated it should be told and most important thing is that when somebody understand the whole statistics or not it's not important they are important to ability to use some or at least one statistical package is important after all there are around i will talk about it a little bit later but still i like to say here there are hardly only 13 statistics every biostatistician is supposed to know biostatistician is supposed to know about the background how those things are developed what a medical or a scientific applied researcher just needs to know what are those tests how to do them with the statistical packages something like an excel something like spss something like a sap or a stata any other thing or whatever is convenient what is easy for them our idea is to verify whatever research we have done is valid or not whether it is acceptable or not for that these few things are not supposed to be known to these medical graduates and most important thing is general language felicity and the ability to use the language and inclination to literature of any language or some of the skills to enhance cultural competence what is happening is that we are not interested to concentrate on any language many of our current students many of my people known to me they are very good doctors very good professionals they don't have any literary interest about anything because they did not read in the past why should they read literary literary things because to understand human mind understand human heart sensitivities is the most important things first of all you should be a good human being to be a good human being to improve yourself to overcome your weaknesses what else some people are blessed they are born very good people good souls but most of us are born with weaknesses prejudices egos we cannot forgive others but a medical doctor at some stage should be able to overcome these things and should be able to tell his student about these things so one of the measures one of the ways which i think is literature inclination to literature and language knowing one language is is not sufficient but learning many languages is not burdensome if you learn one language one literature automatically you develop curiosity about other languages you read them at the end you read the human being human mind you will be able to help your patients your fellow beings your colleagues so we should be able to introduce it some way to improve the language ability so oh. of all sciences social sciences are the greatest yeah. i think so and i came to know this point at a very later stage if i knew this thing earlier maybe yeah. i would have try to improve myself on social sciences rather than concentrating on all these multiple sciences and you say yes now you shall i come and start the work while you message me so na you say okay so so i wanted to say one thing everybody should be aware of the fact that science is meant for people not people for science we are learning science we are doing research to help some suffering person not to improve our name not to get awards not to get pain but everything we do is to it to make it better than whatever is available to the people make the research should be made to you for the use of the people for the betterment of the people that's what is important that's what it will land when we know that of all sciences social sciences are the greatest if we know and we know that science is meant for people not people for science there are certain things diagnosis dilemmas of ethical nature diagnosis can be simply done improved by using more investigations more support from them but dilemmas of ethical nature cannot be overcome overnight because what ethical problems we are going to face we do not know we cannot be ready for that when it comes 
who should be able to understand that what is the problem and should be able to overcome that. If we know, we can understand what is right, what is wrong. By nature, if it is a second nature to us, we can automatically overcome the ethical problem. Ethical problems are not legal one. Many, many one of you know that, not the legal problem. Legal issue, sticking to the rule, sticking to the government order, sticking to the authorities order is not important. That's important. But more than that, ethical issues should be understood, should be approached and overcome. That won't come in a simple way. Nobody can teach you. You have to grow yourself and overcome those. Your own doubts, you have to do that. And whenever you are doing something, whether you are doing the right thing or wrong thing, your inner self will tell you. You should nurture your inner self. That also reading and observation you are going to improve that. Empathy, the greatest virtue of a physician is inculcated over a period of time only. Everybody says, not sympathy, have empathy. But having empathy and imparting empathy is not an easy task. For that, the individual, the person should grow. The grow, nobody can make you grow. You have to grow yourself. So for that, these some of the ways are there. This requires a receptive mind to be told. When, when we go to a lecture, if we think that I know everything, what is the idea of listening to somebody blabbing or somebody's talking? What is the idea of listening to him? Because I know everything or I can read from the book. Then you cannot learn anything from lecture. On the other way, when you go and teach somebody some lecture, some gathering like this, here very educated people are there. Suppose I start thinking that all of these people are medical graduates, postgraduates, professors. They know everything, they know more than me. Then I won't be able to say anything. Because they know everything, how can I say that? It is something like in a viva, the examiner asks you a couple of questions and you tell him, why are you asking, sir, you know everything, why are you asking me? That is not the way. So when we are trying to learn something, we should assume that we don't know anything. And from that person, from that situation, from that class, we should learn. Then only we will be able to learn. What I wanted to say in one word is a receptive mind is important. If your students have a receptive mind, whatever you teach them will go into them. Regarding these general things which I'm talking, less reception is there in most medical personnel because they, they don't think that is important. It's a science, not something else. That's what the attitude. And the teachers, the future teachers, should try to make some amendment in this type of thing. I recommend some general books to read at any time maybe more than one in one's lifetime. Something is known as a quotable author. William Osler is one of the greatest physicians. If possible, one should read the life of William Osler, but it is difficult to read a big book. So they made a book known as quotable Osler. If it is on your table, sometimes before giving a lecture, before going to talk somewhere, if you time to time, you just open. Those one-liners, two-liners are very, very useful. Then the death of Ivan Ilch, written by, it's a novel by Leo Tolstoy. This is, this is important, one has to read because it makes you understand what is death, what could be the idea and feelings and mindset of a person who is going to die and if he comes to know. This he wrote a long ago, a century ago, he wrote the second part of the book when you are reading, you will have shivering in your spine. If you imagine the judge is the protagonist in the book, if you imagine yourself in the place of the judge, you will feel that death is imminent. I'm going to die. This is very fearful. You don't have company. You don't have people. You, anybody, your family, your friends, nobody is there. You have to walk alone. That idea, it will be there in your mind. This is important for a physician because he's facing death a number of times. He's dealing with people who are going to die. Some of them may survive. So both ways, it is going to help the person to understand the importance of life and death, especially for those people who are at the verge of dying. I recommend people to read this book. Somerset Mom's Sanatorium is a book. I did not know about this sanatorium some time ago. Later, I told your Professor Mohan, he wrote the textbook of tuberculosis. I asked him whether they, they mentioned about Somerset Mom's 
sanatorium in their book he said he is going to introduce later something in our lecture it's because i was surprised to read the atmosphere of sanatorium again a person who developed tuberculosis advanced tuberculosis at one point of time there was no treatment except sending to a sanatorium a, a jolly happy lucky going person when he develops tuberculosis and goes to the later stages and put in a sanatorium how miserable he feels and how different his personality has been greatly described by somerset mom i was surprised how could he describe this he could describe this because after first world war he stayed in a sanatorium for two years when there was no treatment i recommend even though we have uh, many drugs for the tuberculosis drug resistant tuberculosis also we are having right now but still tuberculosis is a dangerous thing many of drugs are not working in our case in our country uh, probably the prevalence of drug resistant tuberculosis is increasing very rapidly so because of these things one should understand a, a tuber simple tuberculosis person who is not able to get the proper treatment i have seen one patient in all india institute of medical sciences one lady from jammu kashmir the best physicians i think dr jain pandey was one of the one of the best pulmonologists we used to have he was also very uncomfortable to see that patient because no drug is working all drugs are causing side effects patient was miserable nobody knows what to do so a simple tuberculosis can become like that and we should be aware of that even though we cannot do anything if we are aware of that probably we will be able to do something sometime later so i, I recommend this book to do that. diagnosis solving the most baffling medical mysterious by lita sandri this is a this is a series of 50 pieces in new york times this is read, each piece is written in a very interesting way just like a detective story symptoms are the same somebody comes to you something like a fever you do all investigations nothing comes out you send him somewhere else somebody again does the repeat these things nothing comes out you think it is malaria because he recently visited a malaria place you think something else because he visited another place like that you do it at the end of the day maybe it would turn as a a simple fever could turn like a thyroid crisis a similar lay nerves weakness you will investigate everything recently dr mohan got a person with a uh, something like a nerve peripheral nerve neuritis or something like that nothing has come out patient keeps on going to different hospitals gets frustrated people label them as functional nothing comes out then finally somebody who has seen such a case this fever case or this case could diagnose that who he could be a general practitioner he diagnoses not this specialist the the fundamental philosophy here is that sometimes if you have seen a case if you again see that case then you can pick up that otherwise you in based on investigations you reject that this book i recommend because the safety cases are just like mystery books detective novels but at the end they give a different diagnosis it's good for all postgraduate and all general doctors and very interesting to read and i suggest you to read this then ben h and the miracle of the 15 uh, murders here this is a book this is a story long story written in 1943 why i am talking about a story written in 1943 this is interesting because at that time nowadays they stopped it that we used to have a clinical medical uh, conferences used to be and uh, the pathologist will come and explain certain things you do after the death you take take some tissues and try to do that this was before that even before the boston uh, college the harvard had started the medical clinical conferences and pathological conferences that time this book was written and how this guy has uh, the doctors used to in a, in a hotel they used to 14 or some doctors used to get together and they used to talk before the second world war setting that time period and how that is like a detective story develops he labels all doctors as murderers because they won't tell what is happening they all discuss after the death secretly they discuss because publicly they never used to discuss but the story is very interesting they talks about several things that that will make the student to think about medical uh, pathological conferences and those reports even though we don't have the many of them are available in archives that enhances our interest curiosity and knowledge so i recommend that book here there is a 
the same person a gastroenterologist against international journal of medical humanities as i stressed in the past social science are the greatest this journal is a online journal a blog if possible you can read read it's very interesting i recommend the local faculty each one of you might have had certain books you which you like which are which have changed your ideology of life you can recommend to your students i don't know many of many of you can have different different things we don't have to recommend only from this list you can recommend your own interesting things to your students now one more important thing discipline can only be enforced not imposed but it should be enforced early so that later it should be a habit many people say in our religious things your dr aladdin mohan must be telling that talking about vedas or sanskrit or read reciting these shlokas or reading reading about our epics that should come at an early age at later age you cannot develop that proficiency that fluency that uh, command you will not have similarly discipline should be enforced it should not be imposed but enforced as soon as possible change is the only constant in healthcare landscape earlier i mentioned here i wanted to emphasize so again i mentioned that a sort of mental readiness for lifelong learning is required for the medical students medical personnel physicians each individual has to make the decision where he or she wants to reach unnecessarily or with an emphasis it is told that i wanted to do only a medicine nothing else but that must be that may be a foolish idea for me at that time because all subjects all sciences all branches are equally good whatever you take you can excel in that area but maybe i did not have that wisdom at that time so i thought i would go only for medicine but but it is the individual's responsibility it is the individual's desire it is the individual's decision where he wants to reach what he wants to do market forces money should not be the deciding factor career choices cannot be decided by should not be decided by market forces nor parents i knew somebody whose daughter wanted to do a pathology but father felt that pathology is useless you should not do you should do some subject gynecology or he said it's not the way the pathology is a great subject but she wanted to do and the person i knew that the person wanted to do chest medicine father said why do you want to do chest medicine we know chest medicine nobody cares for it that this is your experience but even if you are a greatest cardiologist you have an anal fissure you cannot uh, uh, do the ptcj for your anal fissure so everybody is equally good every subject is good whatever is like by one individual one should do and as teachers you all should encourage them should not say that cardiology is great something is great something is useless this is this is your personal opinion but you should realize that all subjects are equally important and should encourage them at every every because we do not have the basic sciences in such a fashion maybe if things go like that we will not have that many basic personnel in future similarly we do not have as many anesthesiologists as required you may have seen that planning commission's report which came a few months ago or a year ago there is imbalance among the requirement of personal require available people and distribution has been described so your student may not know all those things but the teacher you know that and should impress upon your students on these things a word or two i wanted to talk about fmgs from our country in our country many of our students are going outside the country to china to other countries europe eastern europe and they are getting back to, with medical degrees we have a dearth of requirement for medical practitioners in many of our areas not in the major cities and around places smaller areas in such a remote areas we don't have as many people as required instead of using this uh, uh, foreign medical graduates because we think that the institutions are not good or are not trained their knowledge is not adequate thinking like that we are putting them to tests those tests are also tougher many of them some of them are passing some of them are not instead of doing practice they keep on giving these tests preparing for these tests and forgetting the basic clinical sense and clinical knowledge so i personally feel instead of giving these tests asking them to pass these tests 
we need to give them extended periods of internship or supervised work or apprenticeship for extended period that may be enforced before awarding them permanent licenses. That means we should give them temporary license and make them work with some of you. And when you give them certificate saying that, okay, they are okay, now they can do it. Then they can give license rather than asking them to give a multiple choice test, which he has not passed second time is preparing permitting clinical sense. That is my opinion. Then, then we say, the question is that they are coming from such an institution that is not good. That is not up to the mark. That is below our standards. That's what we say. So my answer is that the institutional standards, international standards can be assessed by nodal agencies, either national or international agencies. Once they say a particular institution is good, it's okay. It's not harming the student. It's not killing the people. They may not be great institutions. They already cannot be all India Institute or PGI or SIMS. It need not be such a great center because we seems or aims cannot train so many people. So we, we need to have good, so many good institutions, they're adequate institutions. That we need to do that. We should not have compromise on that. So once we recommend our students to go there and study in these institutions, I think we, should, we need not go for tests. This is my opinion again. We may send our students to such institutions deemed to be fit by our experts. Once graduates graduated from such institutions, they should not be further qualifying exam. Here I wanted to say why I was, I was trying to talk about global health. Diseases won't confine to international borders. Diseases don't require visas, green cards. They can spread anywhere like birds. So the richer countries, the developed countries should have an interest in their own interest, in their self-interest, should help the, those lesser or unfortunate people in their own interest. This has been very adequately shown and proven again, once again, by the recent COVID pandemic. And there should be a global approach to control of all diseases. Before having a global approach to control all diseases, we should have global approach in the mindset of our, our physicians, in the practices of our approaches for international or worldwide practices. Medical education should include at least a course on global health for undergraduates at junior or senior levels to sensitize the students for the problems, the issues, implications involved in the global health aspects or world health aspects for all of the countries, not just necessarily to your own country. Every country should know something about the other countries, the problems, in case they have to go there, what they should do, that kind of approach. At least an initial introduction should be there at some point in the undergraduate course or before even undergraduate medical degree. This is a sort of preparation for these people for the future readiness in case of necessity to go to some other country and work there. CUGS means a Conceptorium for Universities for Global Health recommends for such a course for all medical students. It could be an elective course or it could be a summer program, can be offered at many schools. For example, I can say that medical schools such as Harvard or University of Minnesota, et cetera, are giving that courses. We are giving to students that kind of courses even before entering a medical school in um, Texas. And I was one of the um, coordinators for that programs. To start with, we may introduce case studies in global health, such as, because all of you will have journal clubs or seminars will be there. Among them, one of these things could be included. I will just show the headings. The case studies in global health that, that can save millions is the concept. The Ruth Level book, it talks about Nepal, Bangladesh and other countries, as well as uh, African countries also, they will discuss in this. I'm not saying that the whole book is to be read by each medical student. Some topics can be introduced or there can be, somebody can present, a student can present one and, and others can discuss or add their views. Now, another case study is from McGill from Canada. These are also global health case studies, a compilation from, and fundamentals of global health will be understood by these things. They are just examples. If case studies and discussions are difficult, 
they can be introduced in, in the forms of short videos. We can show them in the classroom, talking about or showing about the problems of practice or diseases, a short video. But there are, I always try to uh, show a short video in the class and give them a longer video, which they can watch if they like at their free time. So video watching is easier to the students. In the classroom, if you say at least they watch that, a couple of words go into their ears, to that, to their breath, they pass through their brain, so they remember. If they want later, they can go through that. I may re-emphasize, these are my thoughts, my views, my opinions. I'm saying this because, earlier I told, again I'm saying that because some, some of the people may not like with some of the ideas, so I'm trying to be defensive. So I'm telling you that these are the, my views. You have the right to accept or reject it. These are my views. However, the most persistent thought is a way of life. It's a way of life. The medical or health studies and life for, for a health practitioner, it's a way of life. Unless the person feels it's a way of life, he will not be able to become one of the best healthcare personnel or a best physician, something like that one cannot become. So for becoming one, one of the best in that area, from wherever you come, you should take this as a way of life, not as a career or as a way to make some money. Money will anyway come. When you are a good doctor, people will come to you. Even if you don't ask, people will give you money. Money is no problem, but money should not be the obsession. obsession. Profession should be the obsession, according to me. I feel the uh, now I'm talk, going to talk about offer entry and during medical school. I feel the undergraduate curriculum is very redundant with a lot of emphasis on chronic disease with a little focus on acute care or problem solving approach. Of course, there have been several changes. People have made several changes. The syllabus is probably different from what I studied. But after, after passing while I was in the service, I attended a, this kind of curriculum development program at Lady Harding Medical College, which was conducted by Health Ministry and Medical Council. After three days, we came back to the original because some professor said, I want more ENT. The ophthalmology is not that required. And the fellow said, ophthalmology is more important, not ENT. Somebody else said, if you, we try to introduce everything, my students will, my children will miss holidays. Something like that people said at the end of the day, they came back to the whatever syllabus we have decided long ago has to be continued. That we should come out of that kind of mental block and syllabus is to be upgraded. If there's a requirement for certain specialties, there is no linking of that and recruitment or at the course, at the time of selecting the students or at the time of developing postgraduates or at, at the time of rec recruiting, there's no link. So we don't have enough doctors in certain area. I'm not talking about a particular area. We should be able to understand that everything is equally important. Something is more important, uh, something is less important, is not like that in this field. So much so, the syllabus is so much so redundant that a young doctor is quite inadequate. A just pass out MBBS person may not be able to do much help to anybody. A daughter of my friend's, uh, uh, my friend's daughter, uh, they, they called me one day, I went there. She called, she invest, investigated her mother so much and spending so much money. Why she was investigating and what exactly she was looking for, she did not know. And when all the reports and tests have come, she did not know what to do next. Freshly passed out, also she completed, preparing for entrance doctor. I asked her, why did you do all these things and why didn't you talk to me before? I'm not saying, as I told you, a doctor has to experiment. She can experiment. But she should have some idea. It's all because she never had an approach, a pro programmatic approach to problem solving. That's why the problem has come like that. So that is the state of a fresh medical doctor. He or she has to learn practice practicalities all by himself or herself to practice medicine. The same thing happens with the medical doctor who recently acquired a PG degree. Let us say something, something like an internal medicine. Somebody is in internal medicine without senior residency or any, previously there was no senior residency in our state. People used to just go to the practice. 
But a just fellow from MD medicine is inadequate. He feels he may not express, but he feels the inadequacy in himself. So after after entry and during the medical school, I am talking about that. Though several improvements in curriculum have been made, attempted, a lot of talk on the skill development has taken place. In the recent part, skill development was the mantra. But a newbie remains a novice with inadequate skills. The more they change, the more they are the same. That's what they say. So our education system is very much changed, but remains the same. That's what my feeling. Here I wanted to give the, not my wisdom, the wisdom of some of the visionaries or great people from the society. First, I would like to talk about Dr. M.K. Mani, an eminent nephrologist and physician. He elaborates his own experience, both as a student long ago and as a teacher for a long time. The, he expressed similar thoughts in an article entitled Medical Education in One Lifetime. I gave the reference. You can read that article. He expressed similar views to my whatever I said before. There is one very, very famous surgeon, Atul Gawande. He's a public health expert also, a prolific writer, regular contributor to New York Times. He is frequently, um, uh, he addresses commencements, addresses of students and public lectures he gives. In one of these Harvard lectures, he says, about the reasons for failures in healthcare system. He feels lack of humility, team spirit, and discipline contribute to failure and cause for concern. You all must have observed these problems. Humility is not there. If somebody is brilliant, bright, he loses humility. It's a cost he pays to become a, a great surgical or procedural expert. Team spirit. At one time, doctor is the boss. If you go to 50s and read some Fictional books, a simple MBBS doctor is the hero, no more. He's just a team member nowadays. But the spirit has not been there in the mind of the people. So you don't give equal importance to say a nurse or a technician or even a class for employee. All of their contribution is required. In the COVID, COVID pandemic, we had a great difficulty in many towns in this country. The paramedical people and class force are not available. Nurses are forced to do that work and you all were there. Because we are not developing them simultaneously. So team spirit is important. And much more important is discipline. Discipline is not there among, unfortunately, many of our medical personnel. This contributes to failure and calls for concern. He says, doing a certain thing the same way every time that can reduce failures. Because once we do a procedure three times, four times, we, uh, we feel very confident, so we don't follow the protocol. We try to do it in our own way. In the process, we lose somewhere and try to do mistakes and results in some failure. That's what he means. Now, at the end, I, uh, at the end of these opinions of this great personnel, I want to talk about Sir William Osler's classic address to Yale University. It has been done several years ago, but it has got several recommendations to young students and all young physicians. This particular thing is published as a small booklet and known as a way of life. Here you can see what he says. William Osler does not attribute his own success to his talent or intelligence, but to good habits, consistency, practice day after day after day. So he is attributing all his success to, not to his talent or intelligence, but to good habits, consistently practiced ways day after day after day. So he also felt the discipline most important. So that we should inculcate, impart to our students or your students. History of medicine and lives of great physicians should be spoken of as and when opportunity arises. During your talks, during your lectures, during your case rounds, you should be able to mention some local heroes. I would try to mention some local heroes who are known to me or whom I think, but there will be many, many in every area and the teacher should be able to bring them to life. First and foremost, I will talk about Professor Jade Pandey, Dr. Malaviya of AMS. MS. They are, these are the teachers to both to me as well as the Dr. Mohan. Jane Pandey was our professor, Dr. Malaviya was also our professor, so I mentioned them. 
ఐ స్టడీ ఫ్రమ్ విశాఖపట్నం సో ఐ విల్ రిమంబర్ కుటుంబయ్య గారు కొప్పచి కృష్ణమూర్తి గారు అండ్ ఎం కృష్ణమూర్తి ఎం కృష్ణమూర్తి వాజ్ నాట్ కన్సిడర్డ్ దాట్ గ్రేట్ బై మెనీ పీపుల్ బట్ హీ వాజ్ రియలీ గ్రేట్ హీ యూస్ టు సే వన్ థింగ్ నథింగ్ కెన్ బి డన్ ఫర్ హెవీ ప్లీజియా something can be done for anemia so let us do something he used to say because we all have a tendency to bother about interesting curious things and ignore about routine regular things routine regular things are also equally important and he realized and told me when i was a student so i remember to remember him i mentioned this and that quotation and one of the great surgeons from our college enb sharma charma garu he never practiced practiced never worked for money all through his life served patients and operated and he used to do surgery in a such a fast fashion i used to think that why he does so fast why can't he do easy later i understood his philosophy our life is life span is fixed constant we cannot change that so we can change our speed if i see one patient one day i will see a certain number of patients if i can see 10 patients a day i can see more patients that was his ideology so such people should be remembered so i remembered the great surgeon he was and another doctor from telangana dr a ramaya he is a varangal student md person he is also very important person he has a large number of he is not a teacher he is a worker just physician md but worked for the patients in such a fashion such persons lives are to be told to the people i feel some thoughts on post graduate medical education i think we don't have an appropriate ratio between undergraduate and post graduate seats that has been improved even now it is not so it is disproportionately placed or disproportionately distributed there used to be a disproportionately less number of pg seats when we were student probably the situation is better now but when viewed from the requirement point of view there is no proper distribution of various specialties in our country which i already mentioned to you that should be linked to the requirement then only we can achieve that there is no fine tuning between the need and availability of trained post graduate doctors some thoughts on pg education continues regarding thesis work and requirement for presentation or publication etc i think thesis should not be made mandatory for appearing for the final examination i can say that before 1983 in postgraduate institute of chandigarh there was no thesis for md level courses but during that period people have done the maximum research work from that institute this making this mandatory requirement puts unnecessary pressure on the students as well as their faculty that leads to unwanted unwarranted unhealthy practices i don't want to explain what unhealthy practices are being done unwarranted are also the same unwanted also the same and many of you know these things so i i am not elaborating that point i recommend scrapping of thesis work for pg courses this looks a very radical suggestion people will put so many questions people who, people who don't like this is also will question me so i am trying to give a, a little bit of defense i feel allotting that time for additional clinical work at further honing of the skills of the student would enhance the quality of the works of work as doctors means if thesis is removed that period can be allotted for clinical work so they can become better clinicians then one may question how do they get a get to know the research methodology and attain rigor in their research and publication a little bit of this i answered early stating that research methodology could be started at very early stage of their students life but i can only say that i have which i already said that before 83 pj uh, there was no thesis for postgraduate studies but still the research output of pj was substantial during that period we need to devise alternative measures to upgrade the grip on research methodology what is that how to do it medical students young doctors all should know how to read a paper we read papers i have seen many people even professionals doctors reading the abstract reading the heading and curious interesting heading then going for the abstract and assuming that is final they don't look at the methods they don't take at the materials or how it has been conducted what is the number 
what is the validity of the study? Can we depend upon that? Can we follow that or not? These things, they are not doing it. Knowing these things are more important than doing a thesis. How to do that? I will give some, some of my ideas. Faculty should teach them appraisal of published work periodically on every possible occasion. In the general class, in the classrooms, they can allow that. Somebody will read a paper and the teacher will tell, everybody will tell them. I, when I attended a, a WHO program uh, in 96 in Michigan, uh, somebody from Canada is one of the editorial board members of uh, New England Journal of Medicine has distributed a, journal, a paper to us. As the students in our classroom, they rejected that paper. We did not know that it's from New England Journal of Medicine and this is, they removed everything and just gave the printed material. So everybody analyzed, they found, every student found so many faults in that paper. But don't go by the name of the journal. Then he opened, this is a New England Journal of Medicine. So the issue I am trying to emphasize is that, not that who did it or where it published, that is not going to give you that kind of, you should know it yourself. While reading the paper, you have such a great researcher, uh, or 350 uh, articles this Dr. Mohan has published. So such a person is there, make use of him. Maybe you are from surgery, maybe you are from anesthesiology, maybe you are from any subject, but he has been involved with everything. How did he, how could he do that? He probably focused so much. So if you focus, you, you can better, you can do better than him. So you should look at the, each and paper and look for these things. And you, as a teacher, you should tell your students what you, how you read a paper. What exactly is your method? What you are looking in a paper? That, those things you have to tell them. That is the appraisal of published work. PG students should be repeatedly made aware of certain things. That there are only 13 statistics every biostatistician should know. If you just enumerate them, just 13 are there. Even on those 13, you don't require all those 13. So whatever few things are required to you, repeatedly you should tell them. You don't read all those things, you know them. But these are more important. Concentrate on these things. That should be told not once, again and again. And also, I am recommending a, um, a couple of some books again. Uh, something like a J. Mark Elmwood's Critical Appraisal of Epidemiological Studies and Clinical Trials could be a starting point. This book is meant for the non-epidemiologist, non-statistician who does not know anything. For them, this book is written from Australia or New Zealand, from, I think one of those places this book is. All medical schools should have a well-staffed biostatistics department, not one biostatistician. Unfortunately, I have to say that some time ago, Association of Physicians of India did not have on their editorial board, not even a single statistician. How they manage it, I don't know. But the point is, every medical school should have a biostatistics department, more biostatisticians, and their job is to design, conduct, and analyze the studies or clinical trials for the faculty or students of the institution. And they also should help you to write papers and publish your research outcomes. So this, these things would improve your clinical research work if you want to do. But making this is compulsory may not be a good idea according to me. We should be able to pull all data from all medical research institutions and create a national repository such as National Research Center from where data can be drawn and analyzed for specific research questions. What happens here in India is for thesis or other purposes, I'll try to get some 20, 30, whatever little number of cases. Uh, that's all, I'll try to write a paper out of that. I'll try to do something and make it viable or make it look viable and publish it. Somebody else, my colleague, he will do at the 20, 40, 50, whatever it is. We don't do it together because we are, we are running for the name. Instead of running for the name, instead of publication, we should work for searching the truth, getting the truth. We should get the answers. So we should pull the data. In fact, the government or academic institution should develop a repository center and try to collect all these things and allow everybody to draw the data from there on their specific research question and analyze that. So individually doing these things is not a good idea according to me, but doing together is better. And some places, if you see, they write all the names. Nobody is first author, nobody is second author group. If somebody writes, for writing purposes, somebody's name may be put first. But the collection of the data, the research is group. That is the idea should be there. And also there is another problem with uh, 
some of our very bright intelligent uh, clinicians they are somehow very much keen on doing um, putting all their energies and focus on isolated case reports the, for publication purposes it is very interesting case report they say it's interesting case report but on closer work it could result out like one of our surgery professors used to tell that tell us tell us like this if you examine somebody and you get a single node in the thyroid don't ever diagnose as a thyroid adenoma you look for it further and further you don't get anything but you assume that there are more than one nodes and try to think it is multi nodular goiter and put adenoma as second choice he used to say like that so like that just look at your case report right now you are doing after some time it's going to be going to be something else a major disease which is known to you coming in a different because diseases won't come in the, the same coat and shirt and tie they will wear different different dresses and different different forms they will come the only problem is that they won't display their address so you don't know them so a case report requires lot of work lot of wasting of investigations to publish one case report which may not somebody some intelligent guy will put a query may not be published if published you yourself will realize that is not a very good report after some time when your knowledge base increases so don't concentrate on case report let let the postgraduate do that faculty should concentrate on pool, pooling data and attending required demanding thing. in fact if, you, if i have asked i would say that patient centered research is important certain questions are important to the patients certain questions are important to the publisher publisher means publicating physician thousand biopsies report is no mean it doesn't have any meaning only the project now 2000 it doesn't give any knowledge to you nor comfort the patient so patient centered research may be also a good one of the research methods we should we should try to do clinical public health and global public health or research work is always a team work and a collaborative effort so i will do it i will do it alone is not the thing so not any one individual's personal pursuit as someone said to look casual in a presentation or performance one should one needs to practice more for the best results of healthcare professionals one has to make it a way of life that is the only shortest way to achieve success the way a way of life that is the only shortest way here i would like to conclude and this is the list of the references if anybody is interested thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity thank you all uh, thank you dr shyam for a very enlightening and uh, thought provoking igniting the mind kind of presentation as he told uh, very correctly these are his views how he views life as a researcher public health expert medical educator and so on. thank you very much sir as this is a invited talk guest lecture there will be no um, question and answer session for this at this point in time we will be concluding the day's presentation i thank dr sham for uh, taking out time from his busy schedule to be with us today i sincerely thank our uh, the director and vice chancellor madam for uh, permitting us to conduct the event special thanks are due to professor uh, bcm prasad a surgeon and a friend and we are thank our online and offline audience for uh, spending their time i hope productively constructively in a thought provoking way thank you very much with this we conclude the program today thank you